Hello, friends. Kremlin says, Kremlin assumes, Kremlin points out, and sometimes even Kremlin threatens and Kremlin forges. The Kremlin is mentioned in international news as often as the White House. But what kind of place is the Kremlin? Who resides there? And what influence do they have? For centuries, the Moscow Kremlin was the official residence of Russian czars. This is where Russian history began, where troops were summoned to defend against the Mongols. It's where Ivan the Terrible's military campaigns were launched, and where, after a lengthy rule, he devolved into a lonely tyrant who gradually descended into madness. Peter the Great, the first Russian emperor, left Moscow for his newly established capital, St. Petersburg. He considered the Kremlin walls to be a symbol of obsolete, medieval ways. Following his departure, the Kremlin fell into near disrepair until the arrival of the Bolsheviks. At first, it housed the general secretaries of the USSR, and later became the residency of Russian presidents. In 1991, Russia was in turmoil, faced with a complete dissolution of the state. President Boris Yeltsin's government strove to assume control of the country as quickly as possible, without violating democratic principles. The new governing body was named the Presidential Administration of Russia, or PAR. It was comprised of experts who worked in the Kremlin as Yeltsin's secretaries and consultants. Years later, this entity became the main support system for the new strongman regime. The Kremlin mentioned in the news is precisely the same PAR that had crept out from museum quarters and into the neighborhood. Leaders of any democracy have advisors, experts and consultants to help them understand their country's greatest challenges. They contribute to decision-making and offer the head of state insight regarding how to communicate his or her position to parliament. They rarely influence other branches of government, and the quality of their work greatly informs the quality of a president's statecraft. In the Soviet Union, there was a similar entity, the Executive Office of the Communist Party's Central Committee. It occupied the same buildings, but differed from its democratic counterparts by exerting direct influence over state politics. It stifled anti-communist sentiments, masterminded propaganda, and organized elections. In Brezhnev's time, it actually steered the country, while the aging and decaying general secretary in the Kremlin grew increasingly decrepit. The presidential administration of Russia was built from scratch after the collapse of the USSR, but acquired much greater power and authority. From the start, Yeltsin's secretaries weren't just secretaries. They were responsible for many on-the-spot decisions made without any debate in parliament. The government accepted it as a necessary evil. The country was in turmoil, and its democratic institutions were too young to sort it out. Plenty of decisions were made in the Kremlin's office. One of them was the selection of Putin as Yeltsin's heir. The first years of Putin's administration are fondly referred to as the dawn of the stability era by Russian spin doctors. One might assume that such economic growth would render these emergency measures unnecessary. In a democratic state, the outcome would have been obvious. Emergency powers would have been withdrawn and the rule of law reinstated. Unfortunately, Putin was misdirected by an ailment common to Russian rulers, progressive paranoia. The source of this progressive paranoia is an aversion leaders have to performing their jobs in a lawful manner, including the transfer of power to the next elected head of state. The absence of law means that no effective protection exists, not only for citizens, but the authorities themselves. This is why Russian heads of state rely exclusively on the allegiance of their entourage. At the beginning, Putin was in dire need of clout in all branches of government. One by one, he replaced talented but independent politicians with his friends, sponsors, and protégés. The new PAR was manned by those he trusted most, former colleagues, friends, and contacts from the Federal Security Service. There was never any democracy in Putin's world, only direct and indisputable obedience. He increasingly placed legislative, executive, and judicial powers in his administration's chokehold. As a result, the entire country is now under the Kremlin's thumb, a.k.a. Putin's clique. At face value, Russia looks like a democratic country. The government, the president, the parliament, political parties, elected governors, they amount to a seemingly ordinary federal republic. Ostensibly, Kremlin officials control no one. On paper, they are mere secretaries and experts, providing the president with insight into various matters. In reality, those catering to the inner circle of Putin's cronies became the only group responsible for political decisions in Russia. 
Which laws are required to be passed through the Duma? The Kremlin directs. Who should be appointed as governor? The Kremlin decides. Which sentence should be imposed on an opposition politician? The judge withdraws to their office to take a call from the Kremlin. Do we get entangled in another military conflict halfway around the world? A Kremlin employee presents Putin with a proposal for yet another hybrid war and immediately contacts the army, should their pitch be successful. A political party may run for election only after consulting with the Kremlin. Humanitarian aid is dispatched only if the Kremlin says so. Bailouts for citizens, journalists' arrests, the allocation of anti-COVID measures. You've got it. A call from the Kremlin solves any problem and opens any door. Over the 20 years of Putin's rule, the Kremlin's influence grew. Who else but the PAR could be responsible for the conflict in Ukraine? and the bloodshed in Syria. The PAR is the source of political repression and propagandist attacks. The PAR has its own conflicts and interest groups, but all of them revolve around one person. Every Kremlin employee reports to him, and no other laws bind them. But does this not mean that Kremlin officials necessarily have a plan? Those loyal servants of Putin, elected by no one, but personally selected by him, are unaccountable to their country, despite their immense power. They rule Russia only for their own gain and to drive profits to Putin's cronies who lobbied their way for appointments to positions of power. As a result, the most important entity in the country resembles a court clique rather than a modern government. But what happens to the other branches of government? Being required to seek the Kremlin's approval for any decision, they fall into decay, implicitly obedient to the will of the Kremlin. Any disobedience is punished by expulsion from the system. Any pushback against the PAR's plan leads to dismissal and a doomed political future. As a result, the Duma is deprived of competition and merely imitates legislative debate. The election committee simulates elections and the courts fake fair political investigation. None of them are capable of independence because they're waiting for a call from the Kremlin. Anyway, there's another organization closely intertwined with the Kremlin. It's called Lubyanka, or the Almighty Federal Security Service. But where does the PAR end and the Federal Security Service begin? Where does Lubyanka come to a close and the Kremlin start? To this day, no one can answer these questions with any certainty. What would happen if someone were to get elected as a Russian governor or mayor after having deliberately skipped out on consulting with the Kremlin. Well, they wouldn't last very long. Putin's clerks would immediately look for an excuse for his or her ouster. A full-blown harassment campaign would ensue, involving newspaper, TV, social media and other outlets, ultimately resulting in their dismissal for failing to secure Putin's permission. None of this is unusual in Russia anymore. Every local official, without exception, would declare there is only one politician in Russia, the president. The almighty PAR is not beneficial to anyone. It is useless for the nation. A small clique impeding the will of the people. It harms state institutions which slowly deteriorate as a result of being deprived of the right to make significant decisions. It even harms neighboring states, some of which are endangered by the Kremlin, while others are at risk of following its example. Ultimately, the lonely strongman will be slaughtered by the Kremlin. The longer Putin rules, the fewer people he'll be able to trust. The fiercer his paranoia becomes, the greater the impact of the Kremlin clique. The servants of the authoritarian regime who act against the constitution and democracy. What's in store for Putin himself? Will he become a lonely, power-thirsty madman? Or will he wither and decay amongst his sycophantic clique? Some time ago, the Kremlin walls saw both sides of the story. When we look at the Kremlin today, we'd better learn an important lesson. Assuming responsibility for a modern country is far too heavy for a single person to bear. If left to an individual, the result will always be the same for both the delusional ruler and the desperate nation.